thank you all for being here. We are very happy to welcome Teddy, Cruz, and Fona Foreman uh, to launch the City Initiative Exhibition Program here at YBCA. I have this long, well, now he's heard it three times because we had two other public opportunities to say it. It's strange that I hadn't told Teddy this before. But in 2003, when I arrived in Tijuana, where I lived for seven years, um, I was a painter, like an easel painter, you know? And I found the experience of moving from Canada back to my country of origin very, very disorienting. And for various reasons, the language of painting, which had been my, my discipline for 17 years, I was like a really obsessive seven-hour painter, like many are. I found it really strange and difficult to do that in the context of, the, of this new, new city that I had never visited before. I had never been to Tijuana before. My brother lived there, so I wanted to be sort of in touch with him. We had, we had lived apart since I was 14 and she, he was 12. So it was an important sort of return to my, my country. And uh, I couldn't figure out how to like do a landscape through the window, this crazy binational territory where two countries violently meet each other, where informality is the lingua franca of urbanism in Tijuana, and this incredibly tightly constructed, destructive urbanism is operative in San Diego. I couldn't figure out how to be in the studio by myself doing my exercises in kind of space and abstraction uh, without feeling silly. And it actually was a transformative thing to live in that region. I met a lot of friends. And I, I met a lot of ideas that I had not encountered before that made me more whole because as an immigrant living in Canada, I was a Mexican that doesn't look like a Mexican and I didn't really fit many of the categories and so on. So the end result of this was um, a kind of uh, dislocation that finally found its match in the context I lived. And three weeks really, well, maybe not. Maybe it was a month. I can't remember, but it felt really fast. After arriving there, as I was uh, an assistant at the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, researching an exhibition called Strange New World, which really romantic, like exoticized the other side of the border, but was very important to me because I got to meet all these artists through that, I called Teddy to ask for a bibliography to complete the file and start writing the artist's statement he was invited in the exhibition. And we didn't half an hour I got a call from the artist himself inviting me immediately right now to the studio and I was like what I was I kept saying I'm just the assistant I'm not the curator you know so I didn't go right away but I did go at the end of the day on my way to Tijuana um, his office was in downtown San Diego and he immediately Right, I entered the space and immediately went into a whole narrative about architecture, urbanism, informality, experiments in social housing that were more inclusive of forms of living that are not in the building code in this country. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? I stopped painting. I became slowly a curator through assisting a lot of people, including Betty Sue Herbs. And eventually, we got to work together now our fifth time. In um, 2011, we, he invited me to, as I became an independent curator, he invited me to be part of his, the team that put the political equator. And at that time, we also met, I also met Fauna Foreman, who is now a collaborator, not only a collaborator, is actually in the, in the math head of the office. Studio Teddy Cruz Floss Foreman, which is a really extraordinary thing, and I think an addition that we can, those of us who love you cannot be happier for. So, yes. <laughs> so, this is our fifth, fifth collaboration. They will speak of what it is. Um, and I just will read a couple of things of this extraordinary two bios. Teddy Cruz is a professor of public culture and urbanization in the Department of Visual Arts at the University of California, San Diego. He's known internationally for his urban research on the Tijuana-San Diego border. Honors include representing the US in the 2008 Venice Architectural Biennial, the Ford Foundation Visionaries Award in 2011, and the 2013 Architecture Award from the US Academy of Arts and Letters. Juana Foreman is a professor of political theory and founding director of the Center on Global Justice, 
at the University of California, San Diego, a theorist of ethics and public culture. Her work focuses on human rights at the urban scale. She serves as vice chair of the University of California Climate Solutions Group and on the Global Citizenship Commission advising UN policy on human rights. I have to say that it takes a village to put an exhibition together. And before stepping off and giving them the stage, I want to thank Deborah Collinan for allowing me to have this position. I want to specially thank the visual arts team because without you, I am nothing, quite literally. <coughs> and especially Martin Strickland and Elena Lyman who have really made this show. John, you know, John. Susie, Tessa, and Dorothy because we are more and more doing things that push us in ways that we didn't expect. Thank you very much. And Teddy and Fona, please join us. Thank you so much, Lucia, for that sweet, sweet introduction. And uh, we would just would like to first thank, obviously, this amazing institution, YBCA. It's an amazing space, an amazing supportive group of people. Uh, particularly, I would like to obviously thank um, Deborah Collinan for her support. Obviously, Lucia San Roman, who has been incredibly also supportive of our work throughout time. And, and, and Martin Strickland, really, who made possible bringing everything together. And so the amazing stuff here is just just amazing. Uh, we would like to dive into um, a, a way, a, probably, of contextualizing some of the inspirations that really have enabled us to produce a series of provocations. Uh, as you later may go through the show, you will see that, obviously, the show is called Visualizing Citizenship. And, we decided to um, elaborate on three pieces, let's say, three, three uh, uh, chapters of a larger story that we're developing in, in our partnership. The political equator, uh, which is a reflection on the correspondence of local and global borders at this moment. Uh, and following the second chapter, which is called the cross-border citizen, uh, trying to really open up the urgency of constructing a new citizenship culture at this very moment. And finally, the Medellin diagram, which really gets us to the larger scale or our aspiration for demanding a new civic imagination today. Uh, so we just thought for a moment to open up a series of uh, provocations that can maybe hopefully frame a bit of uh, circulation of questions uh, in a dialogue, dialogue later. Obviously, uh, as a point of departure, we would like to locate ourselves uh, in the context of the crisis today. I think it's impossible not to do so. Uh, but uh, primarily, we would like to meditate that the crisis today is not only political, uh, obviously it is an economic and, and environmental, but we would like to begin foundationally by projecting the crisis as a cultural one. A cultural crisis, and by that we mean the incapacity, the inability of institutions to reimagine themselves, uh, to reorganize and rethink uh, their own procedures. Ultimately, the inability of institutions to confront uh, the, the dramatic socioeconomic inequality that has divided not only cities but the world between centers of economic power uh, and uh, sectors in uh, sites of marginalization and poverty. Uh, so we've been interested uh, in our practice uh, uh, to really uh, visualize conflict. Uh, and uh, Emmanuel Saez and Thomas Piketty uh, probably have produced one of the most potent uh, provocations in the context of their study of American inequality. So we decided to elaborate on the visualization uh, of the amazing diagram that emerged a few years ago. Because at the end of the day, it was an incredible uh, synthetic sort of, uh, uh, a sort of um, uh, abbreviated sort of statement about what, had, what were the institutional mechanisms that had produced uh, uh, such a uh, havoc today in terms of uh, economy. Obviously, these people have done incredible work in the history of dis the distribution of wealth and taxation. So they produce two lines at the end of the day in terms of their study, two lines that confront and mirror each other, uh, two uh, peaks at both ends and a valley in between, uh, moving across time from 1926 to uh, obviously 2006, 2008, 
uh, obviously, again, the, that topography of the upper line is reflected as mirroring the line beneath. Uh, so we all know by now that those two moments in the American history, for that matter, the world, is where we have found uh, the largest income inequality. Uh, our own economic depression of the late 20s and our own economic downturn recently. But what is interesting about their study is that the line, the line beneath actually also measured that at those two very moments, we find the lowest taxation on the wealthy in this country. And so for us, it was a very compelling visualization of the actual gap, the actual uh, condition that had produced this crisis. Because it exposed, in fact, the hypocrisy of the American dream as promised by a trickle-down economic model. Uh, if we forgive the wealthy their taxes, we might all, 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 all of us become wealthy one day. Uh, so I think that that for us was a fundamental sort of tenet uh, in trying to really confront uh, what we saw, the foundation of the crisis, which is really the unaccountability of institutions uh, to engage uh, a project of social and public relevance. But while we all agree with these two moments, we very seldom, and this has been surprising to us, talk about the valley in between, uh, where in fact those two lines approximate each other, uh, where there was for decades a more equitable distribution of resources uh, in this country, obviously from the beginning of the 30s to the end of the 70s, uh, we find the decades uh, 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 organized around uh, the New Deal, uh, where we got uh, uh, this amazing emancipatory sort of framework or a script called the Bill of Rights. These are decades that were defined by a robust cross-sector uh, synergy across civic philanthropy, private sector, industry, universities, communities, uh, to invest in unprecedented ways uh, in public infrastructure, public art, public education, public housing, public health, in fact, public was not a forbidden word from our political language. Uh, so uh, the reflection that, again, this study produced was fundamental to uh, some of the images and narratives you will see in these three chapters, reminding us obviously that this, the history of the city is paved by this pendulum that moves uh, across private and public interest and the kind of antagonisms between them. And today we find ourselves unexpectedly in a moment where that uh, uh, privatization uh, model that will completely begin to decimate further and erode our public institutions will happen in the next four years. So the question is, where is our public imagination today? It's been an essential question over the last decades, but it's obviously so urgent now. Witnessing the current wave of assaults on public life is excruciating. We've entered a fact-free Orwellian realm where tax cuts for the wealthy, the destruction of the social safety net, and key public institutions like HUD, the EPA, the Department of Education, the NEA, the destruction of these institutions is seen as the magic bullet of middle class prosperity. We've entered a time when our political vision seems to be narrowed to the span of a 24-hour news cycle. It seems we're not even inhabiting the same realm anymore. As the top-down public is systematically dismantled, what can we do? How do we orient ourselves, aside from heavy drinking, <laughs> um, which we did before we walked in? <laughs> Let's imagine a bottom-up public a set of informal transgressions that counter the imposition of exclusionary political and economic power from everyday acts of resistance and adaptation in marginalized communities everywhere to our own activist and artistic practices on the ground. Let's design a more stealthful opposition to these anti-public assaults that are descending upon us. What can this bottom-up public look like Teddy and I tonight would like to offer a set of provocations drawn from our practice which motivated our interventions here in the exhibition. What we see as a sort of ethical, political, and spatial set of building blocks of a new bottom-up public. To begin, enough preaching to the choir. 
Chances are most of us in this room agree on essential principles of inclusion and social equity. But how do we engage those who don't? We need to infiltrate cultures of opposition, understand their logics of justification, and decode this emerging new, frightening social and political reality. Events like this one tonight feel great. They really, really do. But we need to get uncomfortable. We need to seek conflict. We need to instigate conflict. We can't underestimate the depth of opposition or be blindsided ever again. We need to retool ourselves. Change social norms. Let's cultivate new social and behavioral norms of inclusion and social equity from the bottom up, and let's shame people who violate them. Let's learn from Antenis Mokus from Bogota and use arts and culture to do it. We need a new citizenship culture that transcends us versus them. A new citizenship culture unafraid to condemn what's morally and ethically wrong that xenophobia is wrong, that isolationism is wrong, and that building and fortifying border walls is wrong. Let's untether citizenship from the identitarian politics of the nation state and the obsession with borders and boundaries from ethnicity and race and from wealth and poverty. Mediate interface. We need to become mediators. At a time when the extreme left and the extreme right seem to be converging in their mistrust of government, let's demand accountable public institutions that invest in public goods. The bottom up is resilient and powerful. This is the lifeblood of our, of our practice. But let's not surrender the top down and capitulate to the logics of privatization. Let's not abandon public rights. In our practice, we believe that the top down and the bottom up need to meet. And we need agencies and practitioners capable of mediating their interface. We see our practice running very much in this vein. An important issue here is how do we construct, as we obviously reorganize ourselves in our own practices, uh, the cultural crisis I was referring to earlier is not only about institutions, it's about us as practitioners and how do we retool ourselves to confront uh, these conditions. So constructing a new language of urban rights is fundamental. Let's uh, share a, a couple of reflections about that. Socialized density. Density can no longer be measured as an abstract amount of objects per acre but as an amount of social and economic exchanges per acre. The small social and economic contingencies of informal urbanization will transform the largeness of selfish sprawl into a more sustainable, plural, and complex environments. Zoning has to stop being a punitive tool to prevent socialization. Zoning needs to be a generative tool uh, to reorganize activity and economy at community scales. Temporalized space. We need to challenge the autonomy of buildings, often conceived as self-referential objects that are indifferent to social and economic temporalities embedded in the city. How to engage instead the complex temporalization of space found in informal urbanization's management of time people, spaces, and resources, as the informal is not just an, an image or an aesthetic category, the informal is in fact a praxis. Rethink property. We need to rethink existing models of property by redefining affordability through the value of social participation. We need to elevate the role of communities in co-producing housing, enabling a more inclusive idea of ownership while protecting a community's right to social and economic sustainability. Redistribute knowledges. This is a crisis of knowledge transference. Our inability to translate and politically represent bottom-up knowledge to transform top-down policy. Social justice today 
cannot be only about the redistribution of resources, but must engage also the redistribution of knowledges. Democratize access. The most emblematic image during the civil rights movement is when Rosa Parks sat in the seat where she did not belong. Even though the bus was public, it was unaccessible to many. Today, we need to move from the neutrality of the public to the specificity of rights, the social and economic rights of communities to benefit from the profits of urbanization. For us, all of these elements converge in the urgency to transform public space. Let's reject conventional strategies of urban beautification and innovation that turn our public spaces into sites of leisure and consumption. Let's question the agendas of new urbanism and creative class pop-ups. Usually, they only accelerate gentrification. They cynically appropriate arts and culture, commodify multiculturalism to enrich private developers, and too often become an apology for the absence of more substantial public investment. No, let's learn from Medellin, Colombia. Public space must educate. Public space must be a site of debate and contestation, and infused with resources and tools that increase public knowledge and cultivate community capacity for political action. <clears throat> and finally, transgress borders. The hardening of border walls across the globe emblematizes a politics of fear and exclusion from Brexit to Fortress Europe to our own US-Mexican border, which has become once again a site of criminalization, closure, and exclusion. We need to tell a different story, those of us who live and work in border zones. For one thing, borders are porous. They cannot contain many informal flows, environmental and hydrological flows, economic flows, normative and cultural flows, ethical and aspirational flows. In this time of global closure, Let's amplify what walls cannot contain and demand public recognition of the many interdependencies and possible futures in border zones like ours. Borders are amazing laboratories of cultural and artistic experimentation. Let's intervene there from the bottom up. But at the same time, let's demand a new political leadership that is motivated by a commitment to equity and human dignity and imaginaries of cross-border cooperation. And in the end, let's not ever become complicit with political injustice by helping to decorate and beautify the border wall. Beautifying the wall only naturalizes and legitimates it. It makes it somehow less intolerable, relieves public guilt, and delays its ultimate and just demilitarization and a change in our public vision. Let's declare today on March 10th with the architectural lobby and stand with engineers and architects across the country that this is not our wall. Let the wall be the hideous steel penitentiary fence that it is, a naked manifestation of unjust political power and let's resist it and find creative ways to transgress it until enough of us exert our democratic counterpower to dismantle the politics of fear that produced it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The group that we had in the beginning did not empty the sol solemnity of this statement. We wanted to share, <laughs> obviously, this uh, mini manifesto, which after all has really been the, the fuel, obviously, of our practice in the last years, but contextualizes uh, hopefully what you will see later in the show. So maybe we should open up for questions. Or well, I was, I was going to come up and ask you one question, so maybe we should sit down. Yeah, okay. 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 Yes. And then we can open up questions so people <laughs> feel more inclined. Well, um, it is certainly 
solemn. <laughs> and it is. I remember when we started working a few, not, I mean, when we started working on the show, we had some ideas, you had some ideas of what it would ha be, then the elections happened, then the inauguration, and at a certain point you told me, we can't really think about this right now. It's really hard, I don't, we don't know what to do. Um, I see this presentation, which I think you haven't done many times before. It's a brand new way of this presentation. Um, as a as a call to arms. But I also know that in your practice there are also other approaches. And you have actually um, exercised or prototyped or um, created links to different kinds of government infrastructures and government uh, offices that seem relevant as a case study. Because I think what I am thirsting for right now <coughs> is actually studies and, and things that work in the present condition. So if we could recall a little bit your experience with the city of San Diego and the city of Tijuana, working in the laboratory of urban civic imagination lab. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. the civic imagination lab. Um, uh, I think it would be useful for us to start there, to talk about very concrete examples. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we can open it up. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in a sense, uh, it's interesting because what uh, Lucia has mentioned is a very particular segment of our history and our practice when the mayor of, former mayor of San Diego invited us to be part of his administration to lead a new project uh, of public space, but really of community engagement. But what we found interesting is that he was summoning us because of our research in the university, a, a research that had really amplified the potentialities of informal urbanization, the, the, the types of entrepreneurial energies of immigrants transforming neighborhoods, uh, marginalized neighborhoods, into new forms of, again, social economic sustainability. So this sort of uh, way of visualizing the potential uh, of what we ended up calling this alternative uh, form of citizenship that is less de defined by the legality framework, but more by the capacity to transform space and protocols. And that we wanted to amplify the, the, the possibility of inform, informal uh, urbanizations to rethink top-down policy. So while our practice has been focused on the informal and the bottom-up, uh, what usually is not spoken about is that our ultimate interest is how we become translators and facilitators of that bottom-up knowledge to push uh, uh, upwards in the transformation of land use, zoning, and so on. Obviously, uh, the mayor summons us to really potentially bring that in the center of power, obviously, which is the mayor's office, which we were super excited about. Um, and, and, and that uh, happened precisely because we had already begun to research uh, one of the most fundamental urban transformation in, hi in recent history, which is uh, the transformation of the city of Medellin. So in one coffee that we had with the mayor when he was brought in for office, we tell him about this, and he becomes extremely excited because one of them, as you will see in the exhibition, one of the most important uh, gestures that enabled that transformation is when the, the, the mayor of uh, Medellin decided to transform his um, office into an urban think tank a la New Deal for a moment because he summoned a new civic conversation, was hugely effective, not only transforming governance into a, a something a lot more progressive, inclusion, inclusionary, transparent, and efficient, but also transform into one of the most robust investments in public trans uh, infrastructure in the most marginalized zones of the city to confront violence through education and so on. So uh, it began to connect the dots, I think, at that point. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, tapping into the sort of optimism. I mean, what, what was unique about San Diego at that moment, it all fell apart very quickly if you know the history of <laughs> recent San Diego urban politics. Um, but we had a mayor who was willing to devote a space in his office to engaging in neighborhoods that had been neglected in urban, you know, by urban planners for decades in San Diego to sort of turn away from conventional downtown planning, suburban planning toward neighborhoods that had really been marginalized and left out. Another thing that the mayor sort of empowered us to do was to work with our counterparts in the municipality of Tijuana because the cities had never engaged in collaborative planning on anything. I mean, the cities share a watershed and don't even talk together about water management. I mean, it's really insane. The cities absolutely look in opposite directions. 
So there was a spark of hope there because there was political leadership. And the cases that we present here um, in this exhibition demonstrate uh, mayors in cities who took the bull by the horns, prioritized urban inequality, and rearranged their municipalities and worked with civil society to get real things done. So all of these examples demonstrate a convergence of top-down commitment. I mean, that was essential in these cases. But that commitment was not simply blind. It didn't sort of operate independently. It was finding new ways of connecting with all of this bottom-up energy in those cities. That bottom-up energy exists in every city. It's just neglected. But what was needed were people who could mediate that interface. And so the city summoned people with those skills who were able uh, to do that. So I think you know, the, the optimism for us has always been in the meeting. Can't be one or the other. It's a needed. Can I just say that what emerges for me in this moment is the resurgence of cities, of the organization, the political organization of the city, the social organization of the city, as as not just offering hope, but actually offering the mechanisms by which we can actually not even intervene in the federal. In other words, the the first. The first gestures, the first strong political gestures against this, this administration were offered by city. It was actually mayors of cities in the United States who criticized. It was the mayor of Seattle, Seattle who the next morning after the ban was actually going to sue the federal government. So I think that San Francisco immediately um, restated its commitment to a sanctuary city. So I think it's a very powerful moment for us to actually to, to, to not to almost decolonize our relationship to media, which is constantly offering images of uh, dysfunctional national identity, and to really reconnect to the local in terms of the, the city alliance. But I actually will stop there with my interpretation. <laughs> I will offer the floor to these wonderful people who are here with us tonight. Um, do you have any questions? We don't have one of those roaming microphones. I can repeat the question. The obvious follow-up. Thank you both very much for coming. Uh, the obvious follow-up to the introduction, here, which I think is convincing, is what lessons have this couple learned from the collaborations with Tijuana and San Diego? And I just don't necessarily mean only uh, in the recent administration, recent almost administration. Um, but also looking back to the early days, Teddy, when, you know, when, when there was a, quite a bit of back and forth between the two sides. So I agree with what you're saying. I just think that you've got a lot more practice and experience to, to tell us about in terms of that cross-border link, because that's a very important mm -hmm. piece of the puzzle to me right. and to anybody who's against the war. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, obviously from the, throughout time, the border region has been our laboratory uh, for primarily confronting ourselves. I think that the transformation of our own practice has been pro provoked by, by the experience of that coalition. You know, all the way to the, the meditation of new conceptual frameworks, for example, uh, that might, in fact, introduce us to very different ideas of the political. Many times we've said that a new political, a new public will emerge from the collision or the conflict between top-down and bottom-up, and that's really radicalize at the border. Also, particularly today, and I think that as, as our work on informality on both sides of the border, because this is really the, the kind of flows that uh, move uninterrupted, invisible to the institutions, has been the framework for rethinking house and public space in our world. Recently, more and more, we've been uh, moving into this uh, other uh, territory that is nevertheless connected, which is the border as a laboratory for new strategies of interdependence. I mean, all of us working uh, at the border, we have always been uh, adamant to un uh, understanding that this, the destinies of these two cities are intertwined. And it is precisely at this moment when the border is being criminalized and understood as a site of polarization, where we think that it is precisely from border territories like ours, where a new political leadership must have to emerge. One that, in fact, defines itself by reaching out beyond the political boundary or the administrative, say, jurisdictional boundary 
to produce new forms of co coexistence and collaboration. So while many artists and many of us have always seen the border wall as a metaphorical artifact or as an experiential wound uh, in a sense, uh, more than ever today we need to transcend uh, the image or the metaphor uh, and really we need to produce a lot more uh, robust forms of interdependence and collaboration across institutions. So a lot of our work right now has been uh, really defining new forms of cross-border education through the, our, you know, our, uh, the programs that we've created at the university uh, in partnership with a variety of grassroots organizations on both sides of the border. But that's primarily what has really framed our design right now, which really coincides with, you know, with, with the topic that needs to be elevated uh, uh, today in the, in the minds of the public, uh, the border is distant as that site of evil or, uh, again, criminalization. But part of our agenda right now is how we move the discourse uh, so that the American public understand that that wall is reproduced invisibly everywhere in the United States, particularly today in the marginalized communities such as Ferguson and Chicago. So the problems of the border that we experience every day, again, are, re are reproduced uh, everywhere, I think, in terms of this um, unprecedented uh, sort of violence and, and polarization. Finally, that is probably the ultimate task for us because what we learned from Latin America and some of this uh, uh, research is that uh, at the end of the day, um, it was a project that really prioritized new forms of public communication we are baffled to find ourselves where we are right now. I think there has been a failure from more, all of us to uh, be unable to reach out to the public in changing hearts and minds to really consolidate a project that is a little more empathetic, that defines itself by mutual responsibility and interdependence. So I think that, that to me is a fundamental project that arts and culture can only do. No other profession, no other, you know, and so that's what we learn primarily from Latin America that not relocates us in a more vehement way, I think, in our own territory to continue advancing that possibility. Could I just say one thing to Michael? I mean, one thing we've really wanted to document are, I mean, it's something that I think people in the region already know, but it's sort of off the radar, is that there is something like a cross-border culture in that region that exists despite the border wall that sort of artificially divides us. So one of the, you know, the, the cross-border citizenship project here is we wanted, in a kind of wonkish way, to actually do a survey. And we worked with Antennas Mokus in Bogota and the Ford Foundation to design this survey that actually tried to understand what kinds of beliefs, norms, habits, aspirations exist regionally, um, regardless of, of, of the law. And what we learned was just amazing. There's far more public trust in the region for one another than anybody ever really understood. And so when you communicate that there's actually public trust and a desire for collaboration along a variety of registers, and you communicate that to policymakers, and you carry it to Washington, I mean, that, that's the aspiration. It's about visualizing what's, what's invisible. And so much of what exists in border regions is invisible to the people who are actually making, making the decisions. So that, that's been, it's the cultural dimension of of citizenship that's been really important to us. Yes. Um, thank you for a great presentation. I've admired your work for a long time, and I'm very happy to, to see uh, you present it. Um, but I, I, I have a question about this, the relationship of informality to the state. Because it seems to me that in the, in the informal economy, informal settlements, um, migration in general, all of these, in some ways, uh, counteract the dimension of the nation state as it exists. So I can see why working with municipalities might be an effective way of engaging the state in order to subvert some of those limitations. But I wonder, do you guys, do you see any potentiality for the nation state to actually turn against itself, as it were, right? Mm -hmm. To uh, embrace those who subvert it. And um, is it possible, I mean, we're all just experiencing this incredible moment of nationalism right now, much to our dismay. But is it possible to use the state to overcome nationalism? It, it, it is a, a fundamental question, but also, in a sense, you begin by framing informality as an act of subversion, or which, in fact, in, in a sense, it is. I mean, we've always said in, in, informal urbanization is really a set of emergent bottom-up strategies that counter 
counter impose political and economic power. So yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an act of subversion, but it doesn't necessarily make it, makes it, I don't know if to say evil. Uh, part of what we are trying to recuperate is the creative intelligence of the informer. And in fact, in that sense, why making it very specific by really trying to understand the specificity of the political and the economic and the social dimension of the informa. Uh, as again, as I mentioned earlier, either immigrants transform their own neighborhoods and inspire us to rethink mixed use, uh, or even the very nature of uh, the uh, collaboration, to the work that we've been developing in informal settlements in Tijuana, where we have declared uh, slums as the laboratories for rethinking infrastructure and housing. Locating, our, locating ourselves within those on invisible and marginalized uh, zones, not only physically, but conceptually, I think might produce a new political language that we would have to carry. It's not to say it's impossible to imagine that someday federal policy would be inspired by, uh, the, but nevertheless, we've seen that in, in Latin America. How, in fact, governance was reimagined by trying to tap into that intelligence. And, and so there is, and we've written a lot about this and how, how to reframe cosmopolitanism at the local scale, because this is a story of municipalities that are effective in, in transforming policy. But that doesn't mean, and this is important to say right now in the, in the context of the political today, that will be in this regard of federal policy. I think that, if anything, a lot of the conversation that these cases opened up is how to it, how are, are we able to manage the complexity, the kind of scalar relationship between federal, state, city, and neighborhood policy? And so that's the ultimate challenge, I think, because as uh, the conversation right now is moving again back to the, the control of states in, the, in terms of their own destiny, we cannot undermine the power of, of the state in protecting certain guarantees for rights and, 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 and for equity. Uh, and broadly speaking. So I think that's a huge challenge, but if anything, how do we conceptually try to bring together uh, you know, those, those registers uh, across the scales is, is something fundamental. Yes. Uh, I uh, really appreciated at one point when you talked about the fact that both left and right are distrust government, and I don't think that it only started happening now been happening for a few decades. So inspired by that and also wondering if we have a different moment actually, and maybe the silver lining of this moment is, is that we could reckon with that. I, I actually wonder at, about the top down or, and bottom up, even as visualizations, even if you're talking about mediating the interface. Because it seems to me often that the top, whatever we think the top is, is the thing that's distrusted and it's the, the oppressor, the authoritarian, the bureaucracy. And that if we keep on talking, uh, imagining it that in that way, that we might be in danger of not noticing nimbleness that might exist within the public sector. Most public sector employees that I know hardly feel on top of anything, hardly feel empowered of anything. There might be more nimbleness and compassion and more um, heterogeneity within governance that we're not seeing if we keep on having a reductive vision of the top. Yeah. Well, I, I think I think we, we we agree with you. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've been so fascinated with really robust case studies that demonstrate that. But you know, in our work we've encountered, you know, civil servants, you know, in every municipality who have more aspirational, equitable visions of what their city can be. And sometimes they're crushed by the kind of static culture of planning and, and the way urbanism works inside of planning departments and inside of cities. But you're, you're right. I mean, this sort of totalizing vision of, of the government, of the city, of the state as this crushing entity and that real creativity is down here right. um, is, 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 is problematic and it's actually counterproductive. Yeah. You know, the, the main lesson for us was in Latin America in these two models, Bogota and Medellin, was to restore our confidence yeah. that progressive governance still exists yeah. <laughs> and that is possible. Uh, while in the United States and Europe, the politics of disinvestment have defined austerity and the erosion of the public institution, 
in those cities, they really uh, produce models that really engage the public so much more uh, in a more robust way. But what is interesting is that the first task was to be self-critical, that the first intervention had to be intervening in their own bureaucracies and reorganizing. Mean, the, the stories that Sergio Fajardo tells us as we were researching this, you know, of how the, one of the first meetings is to understand the org chart of, of, the, of the municipality and, and, and try to produce new spaces of mediation, cross-departmental coordination, entities that would curate transversally across institutions to summon the intelligence of universities, research, and so on. It's a huge, amazing curatorial project. When we hear Antanas Moko su suggest that citizenship culture begins by, by, su by saying that before transforming the city physically, we have to first transform social norms, uh, and that arts and culture can be engines of community participation, and that in order to fight, in fact, a violence, uh, we cannot do it with law and order, but with community processes, I mean, these are hugely inspirational. I mean, these are political leaders that are trying to reorganize a government from the top down. And I think that that's probably what's our ultimate lesson here, is that a top-down project is necessary under the right political leadership, uh, but also because that leadership, at least in those two cases, was organized in collaboration with the bottom. And, and that, that, that really changed the terms. Yes. But we don't have that now. And so. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah. uh, I would ask, just as a meditation, not as if that you have the answer, uh, the question of the fat free moment that we did. Because for now, a moment ago, very well said, and you also implied the Orwellian moment that we are living in, where uh, facts, experiences, and other things like that are of no use. Uh, how do you think? we could approach, because I think what I very hopeful is, because I think it's localized specifics and connected with the real people as opposed to this abstract, sort of like big data kind of conditions, you know, where the likes of Robert Mercer with uh, artificial intelligence and social media and all the other things, yeah, yeah, they yeah. manipulate their stuff. So, so I'm thinking, what are you thinking or what could we in and along this as a line of, no, it's 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 fantastic, and it's 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 really the the question that one has to ask about this kind of work right now. And I think I'll answer you by um, pointing to something that we found so exciting about Antanas Mokus in Bogota. So he was also ob uh, operating in a fact-free realm because the city was completely just dissolving into political and, and social conflict. So the city was entirely ungovernable um, because of basically fighting in the street between paramilitaries and FARC and, and the, the, the drug cartels. I mean, the city was literally unraveling. So nobody was listening to arguments. I mean, that, that's one of our frustrations right now, that nobody is listening to truth. Nobody's listening to facts, right? Everybody's being driven by other kind of affective and, and visceral reactions to things. And so when Antennas took office in the late 1990s, Bogota at the time was considered the most dangerous city on the planet. So there was no reason in this sense. Nobody was kind of focused on, on, on reasons for this or for that. And people thought he was crazy, but the first thing he did when he took office is he refused to use conventional law and order tactics to bring stability. What he said is that I'm going to intervene into this city, not, not physically, not militarily, but through social norms. And what he did, the very first act of office, is he distributed a placard to everybody with a thumb on it. <laughs> And he just, like hundreds of thousands of them, distribu distributed them across the city. And he encouraged people as they were moving through the day to use the thumb to express approval and disapproval to one another. So if somebody did something that violated your sense of urban dignity, right, you'd hold the thumbs down. <laughs> and if somebody did something that made you feel good about your city and that was sort of pro-social, you'd hold a thumbs up. And people began to laugh and the television cameras were watching. And it created this sort of spectacle, this sort of performative drama in the city. 
And without realizing it, people began to look at each other again, and social bonds began tacitly to be connected again. And without realizing it, through this performative gesture, people were tacitly agreeing on what kind of city they wanted to inhabit. And so what antennas to, uh, characterize this as resuturing or re redeveloping a citizenship culture in the city of Bogota. So it was a very performative act. So I mean, we, you know, we, we, we believe that communicating through alternative channels right now than reason and logic and facts and statistics is going to be more effective than communicating in our, in our conventional <coughs> arts and culture become very important. 